your Bibles, turn with me to the gospel according to Luke, the gospel according to Luke. Starting with verse 36. Now remember I told you that some of the scripture is going to be on the screen and some of it will not be because I really want to push you to uh, look this up in the Bible, not just look to the screen, but get in the word. I don't care if it's on your phone or it's an actual physical Bible. I want you to know where these texts are. Luke chapter 5, starting with verse 36, the word of God says, he, he told them this parable. This is Jesus telling them a parable. And this is after their concern that Jesus uh, wasn't, wasn't fasting and praying the way that John the Baptist disciples were doing, not the way that the Pharisees' disciples were doing. But Jesus was like a glutton going from party to party. And uh, they felt concerned about that. So they challenged him. And uh, he shares this with them. He told them this parable. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch up an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment. And the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No New wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new. For they will say, the old is better. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for trusting us in this space as we study your word. We look forward to what you have to share with us. Open our eyes and our hearts that we may see you and know you better. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen. amen and amen. Is not the old better? Well, you know, speaking about it in terms of wine, uh, the older the wine, the belief is the better the wine, the better tasting the wine, that vintage, right? I know none of you know about that. In this congregation, we know about vintage Welch's, grape juice, but nothing more than that. Some of you are a little bold and go to white grape juice, that, you know, a little bit outside the box there. But, um, so you don't know anything about this. But, but, but Jesus wants to use this, this example that is very relevant to his audience because you know in the fermentation process, uh, wine will expand the wine skins and they get to a point where there's no more elasticity. And so this is what Jesus is referring to, this, this idea that those who were his opponents at the time had already reached their limit. There was no more elasticity. There was no more flexibility. There was no more room for Jesus' new approach and what felt like new teachings, although I will challenge you, none of Jesus' teachings were actually new. But it was a challenge for them. And so Jesus says, I, it may not make sense to you, but I'm putting new wine into new wineskins. So I'm, I'm spending my time around people that you would never spend time with. They're new wineskins, and I have to have a different approach with them. In our, in our, in our series called Prodigal, we talked about that. Though the series of parables that Jesus had shared with the people was in response to him hanging out with tax collectors and other outcasts. So Jesus always had this really clever way of of, of dealing with his opponents, this, this, this rebuttal that seems to make such logical sense. Everyone listening would say yes, but I love the way he, he ends this illustration. It's actually kind of a cliffhanger because as he's talking about new wine and new wineskins, everyone listening knows the old wine is better. The old wine is better and Christ acknowledges it. He says, and no one after drinking old wine wants the new. For they will say, is not the old better? We even have a song. Give me that old time what? Religion. Give me that old time religion. It was good enough for who? Good enough for Paul. It was good enough for Peter. It was good enough for Moses. Give me that old time religion. It is challenging in this day and age as we look around in church. Many of our churches have emptied out, especially post pandemic. We were already heading in that direction, but the pandemic seemed to accelerate what was already happening. People got used to being at home, watching from home. And let me tell you, this is not just young people staying home. A lot of our senior members stay home. I see y'all. It's all good. It's all good. 
They've gotten comfortable. They love it. They love being able to watch online. They don't have to fight through any traffic. They don't have to worry about parking. It's far more convenient. But we are dealing with this all throughout Adventism and other Christian denominations, other religious organizations. It is just a fact of life. And how do we reach people who no longer want to be a part of this community? And here's the interesting thing. They actually believe in God. Many will claim to follow Jesus, but they just don't want to be churched, if you know what I mean. Had a conversation with one of our members, uh, two of our members in this church who travel a lot. And they said, we honest, when we come back home, it is hard to get out here on Sabbath. It's a struggle. We can just watch from online. So it is something that we've been challenged with. And so one of the things that people have attempted to do, uh, pastors, leaders, is what can we do that is new and innovative to bring people back into the fold? And there will be that challenge. Don't try anything new. Go back to the old ways. In the old ways, it worked. In the old ways, our churches were full. Our schools were full. So if we want to go back to the way things used to be, we're going to see the results of yesteryear. It doesn't always work that well, does it? Can you imagine doing MV now? Some of y'all don't even know what MV is. You're like, what? What's that acronym? Can you imagine? Can you imagine going back to the way things used to be? Knocking on doors. You can't even get to people's front doors anymore. Remember the times when you, we used to send out all those mailers? Nobody reads their mail anymore. We barely read our email. Going back to the way things used to be may not prove to be successful at all. But this is the world in which we live in. And so the challenge is, Jesus, do we need new wine or should we rely on the wine that is better? I have a, I have a quote from uh, Sister White in Christ's Object Lessons, page 127. It's one of my favorite quotes. And I'm just going to read just a, a, a sliver of it. I like what she says here. She, she's talking about this idea of new and old, right? New wine, old wine. New wineskins, old wineskins. She says, new truth is not independent of the old, but an unfolding of it. New truth is not independent of the old, but an unfolding of it. It is only as the old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new. Isn't that powerful? Right? So anytime we talk about doing anything that is new and innovative, uh, anything that is fresh, she's saying it's an unfolding of what used to be. It's not in opposition of the past, it's an unfolding of it. Anytime Jesus would present truths, she says in this quote, she said anytime he would present truth, he would start with the old and, and, and progress his listeners throughout the history and arrive at the destination of where they were. Even when the disciples on the road, on the, on, on, uh, after uh, the road to Emmaus, after Jesus' death, he meets two of his disciples and they're walking and they're complaining and they're mourning the death of Christ. They don't even recognize Jesus is in front of them. And he begins to open up the scriptures and he starts with the law and moves through the Psalms and all the prophets, letting them know that all these things had to happen. In Jesus' ministry, he never eradicated the old. In fact, he says in Matthew 5, don't think that I've come to abolish the old. I've come to make it complete. I've come to fill it up, make it full. So she says, she says, she says, it is the light which shines in the fresh unfolding of truth that glorifies the old. That's a powerful word. In other words, by seeing Jesus, it should make what we've seen in the past in the Old Testament that much more relevant. In other words, when you get to the life of Christ in the Gospels, you don't ignore the past. You see the past with new eyes. Amen? We can now go back and look at Moses and say, oh, this has so much more meaning when he lifted up the serpent in the wilderness and everyone who gazed at the serpent on the pole was healed. It has far more meaning when you see in the life of Christ, right? New never cancels out old. New actually glorifies the old. So we know today is Ageism Awareness Day, and we've been recognizing our seniors, our mature members in the congregation. And so the message today, I want to focus on that. 
I want to talk about why the old can be better. Why the old can be better. And one of my favorite stories takes place in the book of Genesis. Just, just, just a few points I want to make. But I love this story. This story, believe it or not, is actually what made me enjoy reading the Bible. Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. Um, God is speaking with Abraham. Genesis chapter 17. And let's see the old glorified here. Starting with verse 1, Genesis 17, you will not see it on the screen. We are going to look this up. Amen? Amen. Oh, I hear the pages turning. That sounds so good. See, look at us. See, we old school sometimes. <laughs> Genesis 17, verse 1 says, when Abram, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. How old was Abram? 99. When God called him to leave his hometown, he was 75. Not a young adult, not in his youth. He called him when he was 75. This is after years, decades of being immersed in pagan religions. God calls him at 75, and he's truly this new convert. And at 99, this is when God makes his covenant with Abraham. Abraham fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be a father of many nations. Verse 5, no longer will you be called Abraham. Your name will be Abraham. My man was known as Abraham for 99 years and God changed his name in year 99. Decided to call him Abraham. Now, you want to you make this a little bit more awkward? Abraham, at 99 years old, had not had children with his wife, Sarah. Those of you who know the story really well, they decided to do it a different way. They didn't have in vitro, they didn't have anything like that back in the day, and so uh, it was a surrogate situation. Abraham was with his wife's maidservant, her recommendation, her suggestion, don't be upset, and he had a son by the name of Ishmael. But this was not the son of promise. So God tells him, I'm, I'm going to do this for you, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you, verse 6, I will make you fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you go, after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of, the descendant, of your descendants after you, right? And so Abraham's like, oh man, this sounds great, but why not just my, my son Ishmael? What, this is weird, God, I'm 99. This is weird. I, I just doesn't, this doesn't sound right. So then God tells him, in order to make this covenant with me, you need to be circumcised. Now, understand this. He's 99 years old. Things don't heal quite the same as you age. So God chooses at 99, when this should really happen at day eight, right? As we know from this point on. 99 years old. This is going to be the sign of our covenant, circumcision. And Abraham, the newly appointed, the new moniker Abraham, decides to be circumcised in order to fulfill this, this promise, in order to uh, show his fidelity to God, this everlasting uh, uh, covenant. Verse 15 says, God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be what? Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Verse 17, what is Abraham's response? Abraham fell face down and he what? Laughed to himself. Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And today we celebrated our, our, our members who uh, celebrated their 90th birthday, and this is Sarah. 
Will this even happen? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing, this doesn't make sense. Me and Sarah, we just, we don't relate to each other that way anymore. That's what he's really saying. We don't relate to each other that way anymore. It's going to be a little weird, a little awkward. Let's just make Ishmael the son of promise. God says, nope. I will bless Ishmael, I'll bless his descendants, but I've made a promise to you, it'll be through you and Sarah. Can I say something special? This is what I love about what the Bible teaches. You are never too old to learn and to grow. Never. It's so powerful. Some of you would be surprised to know when I'm shaking hands at the door, I hear far more from our mature members who will tell me how the word blessed them. And I'm thinking to myself, that actually probably wasn't even for you, but that's amazing. Growing up, I was close to my grandparents, as we heard in our children's story. Loved going to visit my grandparents in Vallejo, California. In fact, the reason why I always loved Vallejo Drive Church before I even came here as your pastor is because in your name was Vallejo. So there was already this connection. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. There's like another Vallejo. So um, we would go visit my grandparents in Vallejo, and every Christmas and many summers we would spend with them. When I decided to, to go to Pacific Union College as a student, I spent many a day at my grandparents' house. Almost every single weekend, my grandfather would drive up to uh, Angwin, California, past Napa, past all those vineyards, and pick me up and bring me back to Vallejo. My grandmother, during my freshman year in college, became my best friend. No, seriously. I decided to go into theology, and I am just so excited about this, this new faith. In, in my mind, I'm embracing this new challenge, and I'm sharing it with my grandmother, who is steeped in the Word. She would wake up at 4 a.m. reading the Bible, reading other books. She loved the red books from Sister White. Oh, she knew where everything... We would be talking about something. She'd go, wait one second, wait one second, hold it. She'd go to her library, she'd pull out a book, and she would flip to the page, and it would already be highlighted. See? She says it right here. My grandmother and I would speak for hours upon hours upon hours about Jesus. And there were times I would challenge her and say, but Grandma, Grandma, look at this text. And she said, mm, 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 I'm going to keep praying for you, boy. <laughs> but in my grandmother's last year of life, I remember one of her visits to my church in Oakland. And my grandmother was a very traditional person, and she went to a very traditional church, Vallejo Central. But as she was in the twilight of her years, she began to change a little bit, almost like she was letting down some of her defenses. And at our church, we would always sing a special song when we made budget called Victory is Mine. Some of y'all know that song, Victory is Mine. I told Satan, get thee behind. Victory, victory today is mine. And my grandmother was there for one of those Sabbaths, and she says, oh, I love it. Every time you make budget, let me know, and we will drive from Vallejo to Oakland so we can sing that song. And sure enough, they would, like clockwork, would say, did you make budget this month? We made budget. Okay, we're going to be there. They would do Sabbath school at their church. They would get on the freeway. It would take them 35, 40 minutes. They would be right there in the front pews, and they would be singing to Victory is Mine. To see my grandmother stand and clap to Victory was Mine was challenging. <laughs> Wasn't used to seeing my grandmother move like that, but she loved it. But I'll never forget this. I'll never forget this. After, after one of the sermons, she came up to me. My Aunt Greta was helping her, holding on to her as she was walking. Uh, wanted to shake my hand, which was always so precious. She always wanted to shake my hand at the door. And she looks me in the eyes and she says to me, I get it. I get it. It's one of those messages that probably would have been challenging for some a view that just, I believe, is just God and his beauty and his love and his grace. And she just looks me in the eyes and she says, I get it. And I thought to myself, I don't, I mean, she may not know what she's saying right now because 
my grandmother, I just thinking, she's not going to back down on this position. We've had these conversations. And she, I said, Grandmother, you, you get it? She held my hand. She goes, I get it. The beauty, the beauty in our, in, our, in, our, in our older years is that we have perspective and we can see things that others cannot see because we have walked a certain walk, right? We've been through certain valleys. We've seen all the ups and downs. And there is a clarity that we can have when we're older that we just do not have at 35. I'm sorry, at 17. I'm sorry. And even now, I look back and I think, to my, I think to myself, I'm like, boy, I can't believe I thought I knew what I was talking about at 35. And I know when I turn 67, I'll look back at this time and say, boy, I thought I was saying something special. It's so interesting that God waits till Abraham is 99 years old. You want to know why? The, old, the younger Abraham wouldn't have been able to hear this message. The younger Abraham would have said, nope, we're doing it my way. The younger Abraham would have been willing to fight. The younger Abraham didn't have enough faith and would lie about his relationship with his wife. Y'all don't know that. Abraham was so messed up that two times he told a king, she ain't my woman, she my sister. Basically divorcing her on the spot because he gave her over to the king and said, bye honey, I just didn't want to die. I'll see you later. Maybe I won't see you later, but you're now his... He had no idea God was going to bail him out. The younger Abraham was a hot mess. I should do a series on him. The one we sing Father Abraham about, hot mess. But watch this, watch this. At 99, he's in a different place. The beauty is as we get older, we realize sometimes where, uh, where, where, where our, 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 our boundaries are. We understand what our limitations are. And we finally get to a point where we, we can't do it ourselves and we have to trust God. And now Abraham, who has now become Abraham, is at a point where all he can do is laugh. Now that sounds a little disrespectful, right? A little bit. God says, I'm going to do this for you and, you. and you start cracking up. So he starts laughing. Turn to chapter 18. Chapter 18, he sees God and two of his compadres uh, just hanging out by a tree. And Abraham says, you must stay. You must stay. Come and eat. And they said, okay, we'll eat. He said, listen, uh, Sarah, he says in verse 6, chapter 18, go fix some food. We want to we wanna bless our guest. And so uh, she's, in the, she's in the tent and she's fixing food. And as they're talking, as they're talking, uh, God says, I don't want to hide the plans that I have for you. Verse 10, surely return to you. I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself, minding her own business, laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, Okay, my boo is old. Will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said in verse 13, why did Sarah laugh? Now, I was reading this for the first time when I was 17 years old. I was in the car waiting for my brother to get off work. I was there to pick him up, and I'm bored, and we didn't have smartphones, so we read. And I had a book, a Bible, in the back of the car, which, because I'm holy, and so I'm reading, and I remember this part, and I thought to myself, uh-oh, <laughs> uh-oh. She laughed to herself. She laughed to herself. And watch, it gets worse. Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I'm old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. I told you it gets worse, didn't it? Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I didn't laugh. Now, I didn't know this story. This is the first time I'm really reading this story, and I thought to myself, I don't know how Sarah died, but I know she's about to die. <laughs> You're going to laugh at God, laugh at God, and then roll up on him. <sighs> I didn't laugh. Now, at first, I kind of wanted to say, you know, she's older. You know, maybe she had one of those moments. I'm, I'm 47 now, and I have some of those moments where I just forget what just happened a little while ago. 
So maybe she had one of those moments where she didn't remember that she didn't laugh, but the Bible says she lied. So you're going to laugh at God and then lie to his face. You dead. But listen to God's response. This is the first time I ever laughed reading scripture. God's response was simply this. Yes, you did. <laughs> and then I kept reading. I said, well, where's the lightning? Where's the earth opening up and swallowing her? Wait, wait, what? Wait, God just said, yeah, you girl, yeah, you did. Stop playing. You laughed. So sure enough, God comes back when he said he was come back, and guess who had a baby? And Sarah had to name the baby Isaac. You want to know what Isaac means? Laughter. <laughs> God said, oh, you think you're funny, huh? You think you're funny. All right. Well, every time you call your son for lunch, you're going to know that I got the last laugh. Laughter, it's time to eat. <laughs> Laughter, it's time to go to bed. Right? But here's the thing that I think is so important. I've had the wonderful privilege of being able to visit a number of you in your homes. And the one thing that I absolutely love about spending time with the seniors in our church is how much joy is there. The way they're able to go back and remember things. We were just with Brother Lloyd and Pat this week. He told me it was okay. You know, he, he hurt his shoulder. And so we, Pastor Ivars went, and I went to go visit with him. And, uh, and they just loved talking about how they met. And, and, and Pat was talking about how she was playing hard to get. And her mom had to pull her to the side and said, you better stop playing with that boy's feelings. I just love sitting back and listening to these stories. But so much joy. Because when you get to a certain uh, uh, time in your life, you just don't trip on the small things anymore. You learn to value what's really important. And you can laugh at yourself. You can have a level of joy. And that was something that it, it took me a while. I could even see with my grandmother, even my Aunt Greta. I hope she's not listening because she'll get on my case. I remember my Aunt Greta when she was in her 30s and 40s. And she's different now that she just turned 70. She's a different person. We can just laugh and laugh about so many things. Because life and years give you perspective. And here's the thing, it was funny. It was absolutely funny that God would wait until they were 100 years old and 90 years old before he made good on his promise. God even thought it was funny and he named Isaac who he was, right? It's funny. Perspective gives us a way of seeing life with a different lens, joy. Last point, last point I want to make. This is after the dinner with uh, uh, Abraham and Sarah, after she laughed in God's face and lied. Uh, God then tells Abraham, I'm going to go uh, to Sodom because I've been hearing some stuff that's going on there and I want to see for myself what's happening. And uh, Abraham says, well, I I've been hearing some of the same stuff. Well, what's gonna, what are you going to do? He says, well, I'm going to check them. If they're, if, they're, if they're really doing what I hear they're doing, and just so you know, I don't want to get caught up in another topic here, but just so you know, it was a very violent city. It was a very violent city, right? It wasn't just about what they were doing that was outside the biological box. It was a lot had to do with how cruel they were to people. Read Ezekiel 16. God will tell you exactly what his issue with Sodom was. They were inhospitable and they were violent. And so, so uh, God was like, there were no police around this time. So God would check these cities. In love and mercy, he would check these cities. And so Abraham's worried about his nephew and his family. And he says, hey, but what if there's 50 righteous people in the city? You won't destroy it because of the 50 righteous. God says, there's 50 righteous in the city. I won't destroy it. Abraham says, whoa, 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 whoa. what if there happens to be 45? He says, if there's 45, I won't do it. What if there happens to be 40? If there's 40, I will not do it. Lord, I know I'm just a human being. You are God. You can do all things. Please forgive me for being so bold. But what if there happens to be, he goes down, 30, 20, finally gets to 10. God says, Abe, if there's 10, I will not destroy the city. Family, were there 10 righteous in Sodom? Were there five righteous in Sodom? Was there one righteous in Sodom? Someone said, maybe, and I will tell you, no. The Bible tells us that the angels had to plead with Lot 
all night long, his family all night long saying that stuff is about to go down here. You need to get out of the city. You know what they said? No. No, we ain't going nowhere. No, no, no. My kids go to school right down the street. No. You know how much I put into this house? Absolutely no. I'm not going anywhere. My wife ain't going nowhere. My girls ain't going nowhere. We are comfortable right where we are. No, no, no. The Bible tells us that the angels had to drag them out of the city against their will. You didn't know it went down like that, did you? You thought they just held hands and just walked out of the city all praying and singing songs that only Lot's wife wanted to go back. They all wanted to stay. But the question I have for you is why did God drag them out? Why did God drag out people who were not righteous and wanted to stay? Why do you think? Who was praying for them? Who did Abraham ultimately want to be rescued? His folk. Can I say something? Grandparents, aunts, uncles, God listens to your seasoned prayers. My grandmother used to tell me, I sometimes back God in a corner. You're going to hear me say this a number of times throughout my ministry here. She used to say, I will back God in a corner and I will show him the Bible and I will tell him that this, this passage existed before I was born, that he made this promise before I was born, and that he has to make good on his promise. She had a boldness that Abraham had. Abraham knew he was bold. You ain't bargaining with God like you're at a flea market. What if there happens to be 30? Abraham knew he was being bold, but this is what happens in our older years. We don't have much to lose. I'm just going to tell you like it is, God. And often God had to wait until we are older in Scripture before he could use us. Yes, there's the exceptions of, of very young people like David, but he waited. Noah was older. Moses, he didn't get Moses at 40. He got Moses at 80 years old. That's when he called Moses. Think about Enoch and when he started to walk with God. He was older. There's a perspective we have, a way in which we put our trust in the Lord. And let me tell you something. Our church will never be able to move forward in a healthy, in a, in a, in a, in a structured, in a holy way with leaving a generation behind because they don't get the new wineskins. Let me say this again to make sure everybody understands. I don't care how progressive you think the church is going to be or needs to be in order to go into the future. It is impossible for us to grow this church without the backbone of this church. Without the contributions of those who have come before us. We don't make budget without some of the folk that we look at and say, oh, they just don't get it. We need one another. And this is why these stories are in place. There's a reason why Abraham's age is highlighted. There's a reason why Sarah's age is highlighted. There's a reason why Jesus did not ignore the beauty of the old. There's a reason why he ends his parable illustration by saying, but is not the old better than the new? Jesus can't even do the ministry he did on this earth without Moses doing the ministry that he did. Jesus cannot accomplish what he accomplished without Abraham accomplishing eventually what he accomplished. We do this because we build together. And every single step of the way, we look to one another, young and old. We're going to figure this thing out together. That's why if you have a chance to ever look at what, who makes up our board, you will see a little bit of everybody. But we valued the seasoned, mature experience of our members who have been doing this a lot longer than I have. You can look around here. Our church is getting younger. No way of getting around that. Our church is getting younger. But thank you for your contribution, Abraham and Sarah. Thank you for your faith, even at this time. Thank you that even recognizing that you're still needed and still being used right now. 
Thank you that circumcision is not something that's simply physical, but circumcision, according to Romans, is something that is spiritual, and you've allowed your heart to be circumcised. When I left Oakland, my final farewell sermon, I acknowledged my favorite member in the church. I shouldn't have done it, but I did. I highlighted a number of the contributions from many people, but I landed on the the, the final person that I wanted to recognize, and I said, she is my favorite in this church, and I, I want you to know she's my favorite. Her name is Jean Smith. Jean is probably watching right now. She'll text me probably any second. Jean Smith, you would never think would be behind and support any of the stuff that I was talking about. I joined that church at 26 years old. She had seen it all, seen the glory years. Oakland Grand Avenue Church used to be the conference church there in Oakland. Huge church, beautiful church, perfectly situated. But what I loved about Jean is even though she had seen it done a different way and been successful, Jean was a great listener. And there were times that she would tell me, I totally disagree with what you're saying and doing right now, but I'll roll with you. We'll try it out. We had a, we had a good cop bad cop relationship. We would work out certain negotiations with folk and, and she says, all right, you know what I'm going to do? I know what you're going to do. You know what I'm going to say? I know what you're going to say. Let's do it. But to see someone who was not a part of my generation and us work together in faith in Jesus Christ was beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And we would not have been able to see that congregation go from 25 people to 400 plus people without Jean Smith in her 80s, without her husband Ken Smith in his 80s. That church became known as the place to be, a lot of young adults, but I'm telling you right now, it would have never happened without our seniors. Abraham, thank you. Sarah, thank you. Vallejo Drive, God is moving us we're going to make an impact in this community. We're going to grow. And we're going to see that God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And we're going to do that all together. No one left behind. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much for this beautiful congregation. As we look out and see what you have done and what you're going to do, we can't help but be excited. So we thank you for the contributions of our members who have been here for some time, who have seen it all, and are still willing to remain and figure out how we can continue to grow and do it better. Father, there's no preference in your mind and in your heart of the new and the old. You love them both. And you realize they need to work together. New light, new applications are not independent of old light and old applications. They're an unfolding of it. And so if we really want what's new, we must embrace that which was first, that which was foundational. So we thank you for the wisdom in this church, the wisdom in these pews. May all of us be able to learn something that will be life transforming. Thank you so much for this journey, God, you're taking us on. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. God bless you, church.